Uh, good morning, and can I welcome everyone to the 12th meeting of 2019 of the Social Security Committee. I uh, remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and other devices to silent mode so that we don't uh, disrupt and disturb the meeting. Uh, we've got one apology this morning. Our Deputy Convener, Paul McNeill, unfortunately can't be with us this morning, so we put on record her apologies. And we move to agenda item one, which is a decision to take an item in private. The committee has asked to agree that item four, consideration of evidence heard, and the committee's approach to our draft report be taken in private. Are members agreeable to that? Okay, thank you. We move to agenda item two now, Social Security Support for Housing. And this is our final evidence session of the committee's inquiry into Social Security Support for Housing. Uh, we've got one panel of witnesses this morning. And can I welcome Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People, Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government Housing and Planning, and your officials this morning, Pauline Torley, DHB in Housing related to Social Security Policy Manager, Kel Murray, Universal Credit Flexibilities Policy Manager, and Graham Thompson, supported and temporary accommodation team leader. Can I thank all of you for uh, coming to the committee this morning and can invite Shirley Ann Somerville to make an opening statement to the committee. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to come along with my colleague Kevin Stewart today to present the Scottish Government's position on how the social security system in Scotland supports housing costs and to advise the committee on the impact of the UK Government's welfare cuts on housing. As the committee has heard, not just in relation to this inquiry, but for years now, the UK Government's welfare changes have had a damaging and harmful impact on people, not just in Scotland, but across the UK. There is no doubt that it is impacting on the Scottish Government's aim that all people in Scotland live in high-quality, sustainable homes that they can afford and that meet their needs. There is concern that the reported increase in rent arrears could have a devastating effect on planned housing programmes and continuing investment in housing stock across Scotland. We have seen clear evidence that universal credit is causing avoidable and unnecessary harm to the people of Scotland. Evidence provided by COSLA shows that the rent arrears for those in receipt of universal credit in full service areas are 2.5 times higher than the average arrears for those in housing benefit. Trussell Trust analysis shows that food banks in areas that have had universal credit full service in place for a year or more have experienced an average increase in demand of 52% in the 12 months after the full rollout in their area compared to the 12 months before. This is against a 13% average in other areas. Local authorities are being left to pick up the tab of a broken system, investing their own money to support people in universal credit. For example, Glasgow City Council has invested £2 million in creating UC support hubs. The Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group found that the decisions about Social Security have a direct impact on the homelessness, and the group made a number of recommendations for the DWP relating to the benefit cap, benefit freezes, sanctions on people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness, waiting times for universal credit and the support available in job centres. Overall, the UK government's welfare cuts since 2010 are expected to reduce the welfare spending in Scotland by around £3.7 billion in 2020-2021. Included within this are various changes to housing benefit rules, um, including bedroom tax and the freeze to local housing allowance rates. Across the 90 broad rental market areas in Scotland, local, uh, local housing allowance rates are only able to meet rents at the bottom 30% of the market in 10 areas. And we know that the UK government has acknowledged that the freeze is unsustainable, but not what their plans are to rectify this, if any. It is for these reasons that the Scottish government will invest over £125 million in 2920 to mitigate against the worst impact of welfare cuts and support those on low incomes, including over £60 million on discretionary housing payments, to mitigate the bedroom tax, the impacts of the LHA, LHA rate freeze and the benefit cap. Unfortunately, we are limited in what we can do with universal credit, as it is a reserve benefit. However, we are using the limited powers that we do have to make the delivery of universal credit more flexible and better suited to the needs of those claiming in Scotland. And since October 2017, the Scottish Government's Universal Credit Scottish Choices have given people the choice to receive their award twice monthly and to have the housing costs in their award paid directly to their landlord if they want to. Although we are dependent on the DWP to deliver this and to make sure the clients get the information they need. 
Our vision is that everyone has a warm, affordable home. We want a housing system that works for everyone, and we have taken a raft of actions to increase the supply of affordable housing across Scotland, end homelessness, support people in crisis, and mitigate against the UK government cuts. But we cannot fill the £3.7 billion of cuts that the UK government is imposing on Scotland. As the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights said in his interim report last November, devolved administrations have tried to mitigate the worst impacts of austerity despite experiencing significant reductions in block grant funding and constitutional limits on their ability to raise revenue. But mitigation comes at a price and it is not sustainable. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just before I bring some of my colleagues in uh, for questions, I think it's reasonably put on record that you know how these committees work colleagues discuss uh, before the evidence session starts about you know, themes of questions that, that we'd like to explore. And I have to say, uh, rent arrears was right top of the list. So as, as, as we move towards questions on that, uh, I think you can see the concern the committee has that, that, that that's an area I know that we really want to focus on. So that, I think that's a pretty uh, good place to start. So um, Keith Brown, do you want to maybe start off some questioning in that area? I was actually going to, the point that um, the Cabinet Secretary made about um, Scottish choices was, uh, was the area I was going to um, cover, but uh, since it's been mentioned, I would uh, ask whether the Government has figures. There was some dispute at the last committee, at least I thought there was. I think um, one of my Conservative colleagues said that my area um, had had um, less, um, or there had not been an increase in rental arrears because of universal credit. My figures show exactly the opposite. But I wonder if the government has a, a breakdown as between different local authority areas. And I was interested in what the cabinet secretary said about the nature of the increase once they've had full rollout of universal credit. I assume these are figures which are available to everybody and accepted by everybody, the figures for this. Is it from COSLA or some other source that produces it? Well, certainly I've had discussions with COSLA about what more can be done to uh, ensure that we have all this information. Uh, I think committee members will have had material for Highland, for example, obviously one of the first areas uh, to experience universal credit. Uh, and COSLA is looking uh, very closely at the impact on rent arrears and particularly the gathering of, of data on that because it is having a, a very severe impact. We'll certainly provide what, what we have and, and ensure that um, if there's not material that's been presented to Cos from COSLA to date, then we can perhaps fill in, fill in those, those gaps if, if the committee still has that in evidence. But I don't, you want to add stuff? Uh, we, can, we can maybe give you a, a general idea, and you may have some of these figures already. Yeah. Um, but in September 2017, uh, COSLA reported on high levels of mainstream rent arrears increases in East Lothian and Highland uh, of 29% and 14% respectively uh, for the full year 2016-17. Um, and, you know, these are areas where obviously uh, rollout uh, was happening at, at the very beginning. But I know from my own uh, patch in, in Aberdeen, um, the initial uh, rollout uh, of universal credit there uh, led to uh, local authority rent arrears uh, rapidly um, increasing. Now, we can break that down for the committee uh, in some depth, giving you um, all of that local authority by local authority. Um, but while these rent arrears obviously have uh, an impact on people themselves, um, an awful impact on people themselves, rent arrears actually cause difficulties um, for local authorities and for housing associations in terms of future investment. Uh, because if they are unable uh, to uh, be comforted uh, by uh, the, uh, the cash flow, um, then they are reticent uh, to go and invest uh, in new homes or to refurbish um, existing homes. So this impact is, uh, is major on people, but it also has other uh, impacts uh, on how we deliver business here in Scotland. Just before you come back in on that, Keith, and apologies, I know you want to explore Scottish choices, but on, on rent arrears, the, the, the figure I think we had from COSL was the first four local authorities in Scotland to, to rule out on universal credit, it averaged 26% increase in rent arrears over the first 
over the first two years. What, one, now that rollout is complete and that, that's embedding in, uh, will the Scottish Government be collecting figures on those who uh, migrate over to universal credit? So um, obviously you get those eye-watering figures at, when, when there's a huge amount of people move on to universal credit, but as folk trickle onto the system uh, through, nat through natural migration, is there any analysis we can, we, we can do in relation to rent arrears there as well. So we're not just getting those headline figures, we're actually getting the, the lived experience captured as well. Well, that's why I, I said in my original answer, we're working very cl closely with COSLA in, in particular on this. They are looking to increase the depth of the information that they have, which is already very strong in the first rollout areas, to ensure that we're really, really picking up uh, the full extent of the impact of, of rent arrears. Uh, the DWP um, did say at the outset that they would recompense local authorities for any additional administrative costs that uh, universal credit was causing. Uh, it would be fair to say that uh, since that original offer, uh, they have not been forthcoming with assistance for local authorities in that area. And that's another reason why the local authorities in particular are very keen. So we're working very closely with COSLA to ensure that we're sharing all the information that we have. Thank you. Keith Brown. Yeah, I don't know whether in the final analysis of the, the information that comes through when it's buried in everywhere, um, and I should say I checked with Club Manager Council for their latest figures to respond to the point that had been made before, but one of the points that come, that's come up is whether some of these increases, almost immediate increases in rent arrears are systemic because of change of system and then it tapers off afterwards. And I don't know whether that's the experience or not, it didn't seem to be the case in Club Manager, but I think what would be Really interesting, I don't know whether the figures uh, uh, will be able to um, allow us to interrogate this, is to the extent to which this is about a system change and uh, the extent to which it's about, uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned £3.7 billion of cuts, whether because of the cap put on, that's what's causing these problems, or is it just a systemic change? Um, and given the fact that um, in the Cabinet Secretary's open statement, all the mitigation systems have had been put in place by local authorities and many others, um, it seems to me the whole system was badly flawed from the start and we're trying to make it up or it was underfunded or both. But it would be useful to see if the figures at the end, wherever they're ga gathered from, cause or otherwise, if it can allow us to interrogate the extent to which, you know, because of the cap and various other things, um, that's what's causing it or is it just a change in system? Well, I think one of the, the, the challenges that people have when they move on to universal credit is, is obviously the, the minimum five-week wait. So in many cases, there are people who will be building up uh, debt that they find very, very difficult to, to then try and recover from. So the, 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 in essence, the, the system itself of universal credit is, is building in a period where many people fall into debt right at the beginning and find it very difficult to, to move away from that. So yes, it's um, a change in the system uh, that's causing it, but in effect, it's now systemic within that new system that that will carry on and be very difficult for individuals to get through. And obviously, as Mr Stewart has said, that has an impact on the local authorities, RSLs, particularly smaller, smaller RSLs, when we're seeing more and more people moving on to universal credit. That makes it make a really big difference uh, to, to their returns. I think we have to also say um, that many uh, in the housing sector, the RSLs have done all that they possibly can um, to help people along the way with information. I know of one RSL that was suggesting to tenants um, that they may want to pay uh, a little uh, uh, in advance of any switchover. Um, but these kind of things are almost impossible if you're on your uppers. Um, and you're living from hand to mouth anyway. And there is a huge lack of understanding, I think, um, from uh, the UK government on the impact of this, not just on individuals and families, but also um, in terms of the delivery and refurbishment and service provision um, that is given by our, our local authorities um, and our housing associations here in Scotland and across the UK. In this direction, Kavina, my last question would be about um, a question I tried to ask at General Questions last week but wasn't able to. Going back to the Cabinet Secretary's point about how people can be started off almost right away because of the five-week uh, um, situation into 
arrears almost right away before they've even started. Given the reluctance of the DWP or the UK government to reduce the amount that can be clawed back, I forget what they're called again, the retentions that are paid, I think they've said they won't go below 30%, where a recent recommendation was it should be 5%. If you take those two things together, so your five-week <coughs> wait can put you straight into arrears, and then you can have as much as 30 or even more percent of what, uh, as the Minister says, a fairly small amount for people living pretty much on the edge. I mean, that's just going to perpetuate and increase future arrears, I would imagine. Well, it is very difficult when you look at that clawback mechanism to see how uh, many people that we represent would, would genuinely be able to, to survive on that without the assistance of uh, food banks or, or without the uh, assistance of uh, other charities within the, the area. And again, it goes back to the, the, the kind of policy choices and, and what's systemic within universal credit that just makes it exceptionally difficult and impossible indeed for some people to be able to get out of that bit. Um, and yes, they can have an ad advanced payment within universal credit uh, to uh, alleviate some of the issues within the minimum five-week uh, wait, but they have to pay that back, and they pay that back, um, a, a, as um, you, you um, <coughs> pointed out in your original uh, question from last week, at very, very high rates. And that is a, a great concern because, again, it's about the impact on the individual and the system is just not flexible enough for those that are trying to implement it to allow them to be able to take into consideration. So uh, they are put in a very difficult position on an individual basis when they're going through these cases of this, the system drives uh, debts in, in many areas. And, and that's another one that you've pointed out today. Convener, I wonder if I could also point out um, some of the impacts on um, universal credit when it comes to temporary um, accommodation. I have some um, figures here. Um, three uh, local authorities, Eastern Bartonshire, Highland and Midlothian, uh, were able to provide us with substantial data on the trend of increasing rent arrears uh, for their temporary accommodation. All three of these local authorities show steep rises in the level of rent arrears in their temporary accommodation, which arise both from the processes of payment and universal credit, uh, and also because of the policy of uh, restricting the level of housing element uh, to local housing allowance rates. The increased levels of temporary accommodation rent arrears um, from the start of universal credit range from 113% in Highland to 432 per cent uh, in Midlothian, with East Dumbartonshire, the other authority I mentioned, uh, with a 122 uh, per cent increase. And this quite clearly demonstrates uh, the real difficulties that there are uh, arising for the funding of temporary accommodation rental costs through universal credit. Um, so, uh, again, you know, we are seeing some real problems across the country, uh, which we will continue uh, to uh, capture that data uh, and to talk to COSLA and other partners about that. All of this, of course, um, convener, is having a real, real impact on some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Great. Thanks, Keith. Mark Griffin. Thanks, Camira. I just wanted to go into a bit more detail on um, Scottish Choices and just to ask whether there's any analysis or an audit planned of Scottish Choices, how many people have taken them up, how many people have chosen to um, revert back the payment direct to tenant after taking that up, um, how much it has cost so far and what the government's view is on whether um, exercising Scottish co Choices to pay directly up to a landlord is having a positive impact on rent arrears? It, certainly, it's uh, the, the latest figures that, that we've um, had for the Scottish Choices has shown that are almost 50% um, of those who were offered a choice took up one of the choices. Uh, but I am very interested in looking to see how Scottish Choices um, are working. They've now been in place for, I think, a reasonable amount of time to be able to allow us to, to review that. So we will be moving forward later this year with an analysis of Scottish Choices to ensure that it's working correctly. Some of the areas that I know the committee has been looking at and that it would be interesting uh, to once again test out 
uh, would be the way that it's offered, the time that, that it's offered within the system, and the fact that um, do we need to do things around general awareness and so on, because we are very keen that there's a, a greater awareness of Scottish choices out there. So there is uh, that indeed review planned, and I'm, I'm sure the, the committee's recommendations for this inquiry may, may assist uh, myself and officials as we're looking to, to where we might want to, to take that review and remit for that. Um, on terms of the ongoing operational um, costs, uh, they were just under 115,000 for the period 4th of October 2017 to the 31st of December 2018. The costs beyond that um, are being finalised. Uh, we, the Scottish Government paid just over um, half a million to the DWP in April 2018 for the one-off costs, which included changes to the UCIT system and updates on the DWP staff guidance and uh, training. Obviously, uh, I, we will look during that review and to see whether uh, this is good value for money. Uh, importantly, what uh, individuals who are receiving Scottish Choices feel about that system. Um, and that's something we're determined to take through, speaking to the individuals who have experienced Scottish Choices, and indeed those on UC who may not have went on to Scottish Choices to understand the reasonings why, uh, that, why that has happened. You spoke about the, the, the point in the the process that people are, are offered the choice has been important, and I think you're absolutely um, right. When we were speaking to DWP last week and asking them for a description of how um, a Scottish choice for direct payment was implemented in comparison to, say, the, the DWP's alternative payment arrangement, they said that there was absolutely no difference um, administratively in implementing those two choices um, or those two systems. and so. Do you think it would be um, much more beneficial if Scottish Choices were able to be um, initiated, a uh, direct payment initiated from the very first payment um, in the same way as the DWP's alternative payment arrangement system operates? Well, that was something that was looked at when the original uh, project was being designed, and we were again out speaking to, uh, to those with lived experience about what they wanted to see from the system. And the feedback, certainly at that point, was that it would make sense for the Scottish Choices to come in within that second um, payment time. Uh, so this was based on the feedback that we got from individuals themselves with lived experience, not something that we came up with just from between the Scottish Government and the DWP. I mean, in saying that, as the review goes forward, this will be an interesting point now that people have had more experience of Scottish choices to see whether that's still the belief and understanding that people would want to move on that. So it's not something that I'm kind of beholden to, to uh, say we're not change at all, but uh, as the committee would expect, as we do with um, th um, all the policy areas within social security, we'll base that on the evidence that we get with those with lived experience to see what works uh, for them. Okay. It was certainly a concern that was raised by witnesses that Scottish Choices was only available um, from second um, payment onwards, so I'm glad um, the government are taking that on board. Um, on um, value for money, which you, you mentioned, obviously, the amounts paid to DWP so far um, are a lot of money. And there was a concern raised by witnesses that the DWP were pushing people to exercise a Scottish choice rather than um, using their own system to put people on an alternative payment arrangement. That was raised by witnesses to the committee and that was put to the DWP. Um, the DWP recognised that and had said that they have had to reissue guidance to their members of staff on the appropriate use of alternative payment arrangements. I just wonder, in that instance, whether you will be speaking to DWP to recover some of the money that the Scottish Government has possibly had to pay for Scottish choices being exercised inappropriately when someone should have been put on an alternative payment arrangement. Well, I think, in general, at this point, we do think that Scottish Choices does represent good value for money because it allows the individual to have that slight flexibility that they can't have under the, um, the, the rest of the DWP system. So in general, uh, 
yes, it's good value for money. Obviously, um, it would be more advantageous to the Scottish Government if there was inbuilt flexibility into the UC system full stop and therefore these types of choices would be available at a UK level and we wouldn't have to be using Scottish Government block grant to actually provide those choices. They would just be done as a matter of course. Uh, and I think that's regrettable that, again, we're having to use the, the Scottish Government block grant to make a reserved benefit slightly better. Uh, it's an interesting point that you raise, and I've, I've um, seen the evidence uh, sessions that the committee has had are around the administration of uh, the Scottish choices in particular. In general, I say we are satisfied that, that the DWP are administering uh, the UC Scottish choices correctly. But as I say, the evidence that the committee's had is exceptionally interesting in that, and that will be something uh, that we will pick up with the DWP directly. Um, I'm very interested in, in um, the material that the committee has had, and we will look into that further. Okay, and finally, Convena, um, just on the the policy decision on Scottish choice to have um, a default paid to the tenant and an opportunity for a choice to be made to pay direct to the landlord. We've had a number of witnesses who have said it would be beneficial for the system to work in the, the opposite way for um, rent to be paid direct to the landlord as a default, but still maintaining and preserving the choice for um, those on universal credit to um, take control of their own rental payment and managing their own budget. In review of Scottish choices, is that something the Scottish Government would um, keep open to consideration? Well, again, I think it's, it's been interesting to see the, the evidence that the committee has taken on this. I would take it back to first principles, I suppose, about our belief in social security being a, a human right and it being for the individual to choose how their social security payments are um, implemented. Now, I can see the reasoning why some of the witnesses have suggested an alternative approach uh, to that. I would be quite uncomfortable about taking away the right of the individual to make that choice uh, and um, assuming as a default that it should go straight to a landlord. Uh, it's, again, something that can be looked at, but I think we have to look at it on the basis of does that fulfil the core principles of what we are trying to achieve within social security in Scotland, uh, which is for the individual to have a choice about how their payment is made. Just briefly again, come here. there was a number of um, people with, with different opinions on where the default should lie, but actually citizen advice um, evidence said that there shouldn't be a default in any way and um, that the choice should just be offered to uh, the claimant at the outset. Do you want this paid um, directly to you or to the tenant? There was no um, default at all and just wonder what your view on that since that would seem to um, maintain the first, going back to first principles, that principle of um, human right that you talked about. Well, I think that does more relate to the first principles that, that we have. Again, the, the Citizens Advice Scotland um, evidence in this area was very interesting. And that's the types of things that the review could, could certainly look at, is about how we, uh, in essence, constantly check what we're doing within Scottish Choices uh, and other areas of social security around the first principles that were in the Act, because uh, obviously things have moved on a lot since Scottish Choices were implemented because of what else we're doing in social security. So once we have established the review, again, the evidence that the committee has taken on this area in general, including that of Citizens Advice Scotland, will be very useful as we move forward, because as I said earlier, we'll pay very close attention to what those with lived experience are saying of the system. Uh, but the stakeholders, and particularly Citizens Advice, who uh, will deal with many people with rent arrears and concerns around universal credit, will really be, uh, again, crucial to uh, our review and to ensuring that we're, we're capturing all that possible information. And of course, I'd be more than happy to provide the committee with further updates on that as we move forward with that in due course. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Can I maybe ask um, whether the Scottish Government can provide information in relation to uh, those claimants who have exercised Scottish choices in terms of having payments go direct to the landlord and their level of rent arrears or otherwise vis-à-vis -vis those who are getting the, the, the money themselves and then go on to pay their rent? 
have we got an evidence base to say the application of Scottish choices reduces rent arrears? Well, I think that's one of the areas where we again have to look at the evaluation of Scottish choices and the impact that that's having. So it's not something we could provide to the committee directly at this point, but it's again something now that Scottish choices has been run up and running uh, for a reasonable amount of time that we can now look to evaluate. I think the committee would find it helpful, even if not today, even if you know, anecdotally you're aware of local authorities or housing associations that can say, well, actually, we, we've done that. Uh, audit of, of our tenants and, and we can see that those who have exercised Scottish choices are less likely to, to have rent arrears. I'm also wondering whether or not, uh, and uh, Mr Stewart spoke about uh, local authorities and housing associations very, very reliant on that rental income to refurbish homes and to also use it in terms of investment and give banks assurances when they borrow money for, for new build stock. Is, is there something there in terms of giving confidence to the sector? The, the, the greater degree of exercise of Scottish choices that you have as well. So a bit more information, I think, would, would be helpful, Mr Stewart. Uh, convener, um, as you're well aware, I have regular discussions with uh, COSLA housing conveners uh, and with the Scottish Federation of Housing Association and the Glasgow uh, and West of Scotland Housing Association Forum. Um, and while um, some of these uh, issues uh, have come up, um, I've had no um, direct data from them on some of this, but that's something that we can um, seek if we want to add uh, to the da data pool um, that we have. I have to say, convener, that um, a number of these bodies are not backward in coming forward uh, if they feel that there's real issues or anomalies, but that's certainly something that I can raise when I, I ne next meet with them. Okay, I think, I think that's helpful. Can I ask colleagues, do we have any more questions on Scottish choices? Alistair Allen. Thank you. Um, I just wonder, if, firstly, if you want to say anything about the process by which social landlords are, are um, collecting their rent, and, and is there anything they could be doing themselves to, to try and minimise uh, some of the, the impacts of uh, the introduction of universal credit? Um, as I indicated to Mr Brown earlier, um, you know, many of the social landlords that we have are extremely proactive uh, in terms of helping uh, their, their tenants. Uh, in some cases, that's probably uh, above and beyond the call of duty, um, but of course they have uh, to protect um, their cash flow too. Um, as I said to Mr Brown, you know, I know of one case where uh, a housing association tried to get folk to pay a little bit extra up front. But that's not possible um, in a, a lot of cases. Um, and some of the housing associations in particular have got absolutely fantastic money advice schemes. Um, and, you know, they do their level best. Uh, to try and give people the best advice so that they don't get caught in that poverty trap. Uh, and also it's in their interest because, you know, that means that they are, are um, getting the, the rental payment um, and arrears uh, are not happening. Um, I think that um, one of the other things is that um, DWP themselves have co committed to fix social landlord payment schedules. Um, and, I, I, you know, I think that that is a, a, a way forward too. Um, we continue uh, to have discussions all of the time about this issue, as you could well imagine, um, with housing associations uh, and councils. What we uh, always try and do is where we find good practice in these regards, um, then we try and ensure that we export that best practice. And I have to say that the likes of the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations is immensely uh, good at that as well. However, um, in order to help folk in circumstances like that, to maximise um, their income, um, uh, all of that is good. But as I, as I said to Mr Brown as well, if you are living from hand to mouth and you're on your uppers and your income is maximised and all of these anomalies that have been put in place by the UK government have been brought to bear on you, there's not a lot that can be done. 
There's not a lot that can be done. And what we have is a system at this moment in time um, which are, are putting those folks who are the most vulnerable even uh, into greater depth of depths of despair because of an ill-thought-out system. Obviously, one of those pressures that we're, we've talked about, you, you've talked about, um, is, is weight, uh, the, the weight that some people have for, or most people have for an initial payment. I just wonder, again, although you've touched on, on some of these issues, I just wondered what you made of the, the DEWP uh, and, their, and their assessment that the first payment, payment, payment uh, period is needed for the work coach to assess whether an alternative payment arrangement is needed. And, and their, their explanation around that, that this is somehow needed for the process to work? I think it's very difficult to, to ag agree with that assumption that that five-week wait is needed because of the impact it's, it's having on, on people. Now, uh, I have a, a great deal of respect for the work coaches at an individual level uh, who are... Uh, trying very hard to implement a system as best as it can be for the people that are in front of them. Uh, but there is no doubt that work coaches will be sitting with people and they know that they can't wait five weeks. And it, I have to, to, to stress, of course, it's a minimum of five-week wait. There are many, many people uh, who will wait more than that five weeks. And that's why it's very important that the, the actual systemic problem within universal credit and that five-week wait is looked at urgently. Now, the UK government seem to take that on in some aspects because, for example, in, in some of the, the areas around migration, there will be some uh, transfer security for some people and a, a two-week run-on. But that's not in all cases, and that doesn't protect everybody. But it does rather hint that the DWP know there's a problem there because for some people there's a transitional arrangement put in place. But if you don't qualify for those transitional arrangements, you don't get that. So I think there does need to be a very serious investigation about the, uh, the implications of the, the five-week wait by the DWP. I would suggest the evidence is already out there, not from the Scottish Government, but from uh, very well-respected third-sector charities and, and think tanks who have provided that evidence direct to the Select Committee there at Westminster, for example. So there is strong evidence out there to suggest that the five-week wait is having an impact and that there are ways where the system could prevent that from happening. You say that the DWP and the UK government should have a think about that and should review that. Is there any sign that they are actually doing that? They are exceptionally beholden to the policy of universal credit, and that's despite the evidence to the, contra to the contrary that there's no impact on people. Uh, the, uh, the UK government are absolutely perfectly entitled to have uh, different policy proposals when it comes to reserve benefits uh, like this. Uh, but I think what's disappointing is around some of these areas in universal credit, the evidence is really stark and it is from uh, organisations who you would expect normally a government to listen to when they are all coming together. Um, and indeed, the Select Committee in the House of Commons has also raised these challenges as, as well. And I think that's deeply disappointing when there's such a strength of evidence out there, but that's, there, there doesn't seem any willingness at this point, I can see, within the UK government to change on universal credit. It's not one of the areas that the new Secretary of State um, seems to be looking at in particular is around that five-week wait. Now, she has said that she is listening. That is a welcome difference to our predecessor. Uh, but there are areas where I think uh, if she's listening, then the evidence is, is really very loud and clear for her to hear. OK, we'll move on now. Sure, Robertson. I just wanted to move on to um, DHPs. Um, I think the evidence so far uh, generally is that um, people view DHPs as having had a, a positive impact, um, not least in preventing arrears. And certainly I know from my own uh, casework that, that that is it's very much the case. 
I think where there are some questions arising is maybe firstly, obviously the, the bulk of the DHP budget goes on bedroom tax mitigation applying to the social rented sector, but the £11 million uh, for other uh, spend um, could of course um, include support for private sector tenants, which we've been looking at, um, or so, uh, social rented sector tenants affected by other welfare reforms. What um, work has been undertaken by the government to assess the impact of that element of DHP funding, so the, the 11 million non-bedroom tax mitigation? Have you looked at how local authorities are uh, individually and collectively spending that money in order to assess its impact and perhaps where whether the allocation of that is right uh, between local authorities and whether or not the overall um, balance of the, the 52 million and the 11 million is right in the light of some of those pressures? Um, first of all, convener, I should say that the administration of uh, direct housing payments is fully devolved to, to local authorities, um, who are, um, in our opinion, uh, best placed to understand and support local communities and households in their own areas. Um, the DHPs themselves are, are used to uh, alleviate hardship uh, caused by an inability to pay housing costs. Uh, and as such, at times, it can be very, very difficult uh, to determine a, a single factor for that. Um, Ms. Robeson asked uh, around about um, data and how we collect that. The government itself publishes uh, official statistics on uh, uh, the number of DHP awards, um, the total spend uh, per local authority, um, and uh, we also collect and, and monitor outturn data uh, from councils on a biannual basis. Um, this data includes spend by each local authority um, for uh, LHA, for the benefit cap, uh, and uh, core DHPs. Uh, and we uh, do intend to start publishing um, this data uh, uh, this, uh, in 2019-20. Um, the funding itself um, is distributed in a formula um, that was agreed with COSLA. Um, and in agreeing that formula, um, we take into consideration the outturn data that I've talked about uh, from the previous years and from other factors, um, such as if there was to be rollout of universal credit in that area uh, coming up. Um, we as has already been pointed out, um, are investing over £125 million pounds to mitigate against the worst impacts of, of welfare reform. Uh, that was to effectively abolish uh, the bedroom tax and to support those in low in incomes. Um, but since the devolution of, of DHP funding uh, from the DWP, uh, the Scottish Government has significantly increased the funding available, uh, providing an extra £6.1 million, pounds, as the committee is probably already aware, to help those folks that are most affected by these welfare reforms, which includes uh, things like the benefit cap and, of course, uh, local housing allowance. Um, we continue to talk to partners. Uh, we know um, that some local authorities um, are adding uh, to their uh, DHP budgets from their own resource, which they have the ability to do. Um, uh, and that is where we are, are at at present. But you can be assured that we will continue to monitor all of these situations. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly aware that, that some local authorities, uh, including my own, uh, I think, are adding to, to that budget, um, which um, is um, important. Um, but obviously, uh, as a, I guess the Scottish Government has had to look to your own resources to mitigate, local authorities are, are similarly doing that. So it's a, a, a double whammy in some respects um, um, in trying to mitigate um, um, the impact of, of reserve benefits. Coming back to the, the issue, of, and I accept what you're saying about you know, the, the, 
DHPs are, are devolved to local governments for them to decide. But obviously, there have been, as I'm sure you're aware, um, some concerns raised about, about variation in, in how those payments are being made and how that spend is, is being uh, overseen by individual local authorities. Under the, um, the 2018 Act, of the Scottish Government now has the power to issue guidance, and you'll be aware again that, that some witnesses have suggested that it would be beneficial for the Scottish Government to issue guidance. Um, what's your thoughts about that? Is that something that you would... Because at the moment, as I understand it, they're following DWP guidance. So. What what we have at the present moment, um, convener, is um, some interim guidance, but in the main, um, uh, councils are following uh, DWP guidance with that intra guidance note sitting uh, alongside that. Um, and that, of course, has been provided to local authorities by the Scottish Government. Um, we're currently drawing up um, full statutory guidance uh, on all of this. Obviously, we're doing that in conjunction with the councils and with COSLA, um, and uh, that will be available uh, once we have uh, consulted on uh, the, the, the draft. Um, it's probably too early for us to say how much that would differ from the current uh, DWT guidance with the interim guidance note that we've put into to play uh, but we are uh, working together in a working group with uh, COSLA uh, uh, to ensure that that uh, guidance is drawn up and that consultation will take place um, as I understand at the moment uh, we have had no um, uh, difficulties uh, given to us from local authorities about the current guidance that is being used with the interim uh, uh, note that goes alongside it. Um, but we hope to have our, our own guidance uh, very, very soon. Okay, that's fine. Okay, General Balfour. On that uh, point, Minister, I mean, obviously, we're now just over a year since the Act was implemented, um, and both powers haven't been taken yet or by the Scottish Government. You said in a minute, does, what does that mean in kind of layman's language? Are we talking six months, nine months, 12 months before we see these and, and, and those and moving away from DWP to Scottish Government? Uh, convener, I don't think I used the word imminent in anything that I said previously, um, but um, we are working in partnership with COSLA, with local authorities in order to get this right. If there was a difficulty um, with the current use of the DWP guidance with the interim note that we've issued, um, then obviously uh, we would uh, be trying to move apace. But one of the things is that we have an opportunity to here to get this absolutely right um, for everyone here in Scotland uh, and to address the issues that may have been raised during the course uh, of this committee. So we will continue to work with that working group uh, with COSLA and local authorities uh, we will move to consultation uh, and we will issue uh, that guidance as soon as it is practicable, practicable to do so. Okay, I'd like to come back on that, Mr Balfour. Um, just mop up something there. Can I, we've heard some concerns that um, the introduction of universal credit, there's problems getting DHPs for bedroom tax mitigation uh, for some universal credit tenants and that was in relation to because local authorities are not necessarily processing housing benefit anymore it's done differently under U UC obviously they're not always aware where that issue um, is actually occurring uh, have you heard has the cabinet secretary or the minister heard any of those concerns and what can we do to to rectify that well it, there is a concern around this area because it was the ability for local authorities to be able to access information um, on housing benefit that would infer who may be eligible for a discretionary housing payment. If you're not on housing benefit, it therefore makes it more difficult to be able to, um, to, to look at how you alleviate some of the problems for, with uh, the use of, of DHP. So that, that is a, a particular concern. And that's uh, one of the, the reasons why we are concerned about our current mitigation 
of the bedroom tax. We want to be able to abolish the bedroom tax at source, uh, but the bedroom tax does still exist within Scotland, um, and we are simply mitigating against that. Uh, but it is getting more difficult to do that because of the fact that we have this challenge about access to information to do with universal credit. That is why it's very disappointing that the DWP has put back the timetable for the mitigation of source of the bedroom tax from April 2019 uh, to May 2020 at the earliest. Now, we are entirely beholden on the DWP to be able to mitigate the bedroom tax, so the policy um, is there, but it is unfortunately not within the Scottish Government's gift to be able to deliver that policy objective. We need the DWP to do that, and that is causing us more problems um, than we would like, given the timescale that's been involved with that. I'm just finally, I'm just, just wondering then, given there's been slippage in, in that timetable, is the Scottish Government doing the work it has to do so that eventually when that does happen, uh, the Scottish Government can move quickly to mitigate, if not abolish the bedroom tax, effectively mitigate it at source? Is, that, is the work ongoing about how, how the Government would go about achieving that? Well, we need the DWP to, to mitigate it because it's a change to the DWP system. So the policy has been agreed, but it's, it's a change, an inherent change in the DWP IT systems. And that's where you come down to, quite frankly, where you are on the list on the DWP. And they are not short of IT projects and information um, and analysis that they need to, to do within the wider DWP and the devolution of benefits is one small part of a very, very, very large uh, department. But we're also aware of the, the greater administrative burden that is being brought on, um, on local authorities because of their handling of DHPs, um, and that's obviously increases as the UC caseload increases. So we're also calling and asking on the DWP to take active steps with us uh, to support local authorities in delivering DHPs in a world where there is still universal credit until we move to that uh, solution of abolishing the bedroom tax at source. OK, thank you very much. We'll move on. Michelle Ballantyne. Right, good morning. Um, yes, I want to move on to talk about LHAs. Um, you'll be aware, having watched our sessions, that we've had quite a bit of discussion around the impact of local um, housing allowance and the broad market rental areas in Scotland. So um, the question this morning is, what scope does the Scottish Government have to use its UC powers to amend LHA rates and the BRMAs? Um, and have you considered using those powers? And, and if so, um, have you sort of costed what that might in what costs that might incur um, if we were to go down that rate, um, and appreciating that you'd prefer the DWP to do it rather than yourselves. But if they don't, and they have indicated they're not going to look at um, the BRMAs particularly, so just wondered where, what your positioning on it was. Um, convener, um, although the Scotland Act uh, powers give us some flexibility um, in how the universal credit housing costs element is calculated. Uh, using in these powers in practice uh, to change LHA rates uh, would be uh, very, very challenging indeed. Uh, also, um, as we have no power over housing benefit, uh, this would create a two-tier system in the private rented sector and a three-tier system overall uh, with the mitigation of the bedroom tax on the social rented sector. Uh, any change would not only be very, very expensive, uh, but of course would still have to be delivered by the DWP. Um, and as we are currently um, working with the DWP to uh, abolish the bedroom tax at source, um, and are committed to introducing split payments in universal credit, uh, changes to support for the private rented sector uh, will not be uh, feasible in the short term, if ever at all. Um, now, following on, uh, convener, from the recommendations of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group, um, we have committed to analysing the interaction between uh, the LHA rate and homelessness during the course of this year. 
um, it would make much more sense um, for the Scottish Government uh, to stop mitigating these uh, cuts and for Social Security to be devolved completely um, to Scotland. Uh, we know that the UK Government itself uh, recognises that the freeze in LHA rates is unsustainable. So I would suggest that because they know, it, know that, that they unfreeze all of this now and ensure that we're not driving the most vulnerable people in our country uh, into even more debt and despair. No. Okay, so um, basically you don't see the Scottish Government doing anything around LHA and BRMAs at all. Um, what, would you like, what would you like done if it was done by the Government? I mean, they've already said, the UK Government, they've already said they're going to lift the freeze, obviously, but what changes would you like to see around LHA and BRMAs, if well, any? Convener, they need to lift the freeze uh, and bring all of this back to a sense of reality. Now, it's not just the Scottish Government that is saying this. Um, I think that Ms Ballantyne would find that every third sector organisation um, in Scotland and across the UK are saying exactly like the same thing. I'm telling you what I'd like yeah. to see. I'd like the UK Government uh, to take a, a realistic uh, stance in terms of helping the most vulnerable people in our society. Um, it would be absolutely the wrong thing for us to do uh, to try and create a three-tier system which may not be able to work and which we would be dependent on the DWP in delivering. What we actually require is the UK government to stop its social security cuts, to take a long, hard look at themselves and to ensure uh, that the most vulnerable folk in our society are protected. So they should be unfreezing the LHS, LHA rates now uh, and bringing them back in to some kind of reality, convener. Well, can I ask the question, the simple question, what, you use the word reality, are you wanting it at the 30th percentile, the 50th? I, I'm actually asking you, where you would, what you would like to see done to it. Where do you want it? I, I want it to recognise what market rates are in particular areas. We can uh, argue about the percentiles here till the cows come home. What we actually need to do is to be able to put money in folks' pockets so that they're able to pay the rent uh, in their place, whether they be in Aberdeen, uh, Shetland or Dumfries and Galloway. That is the realistic position that we should be getting at, rather than ripping £3.7 billion worth of social security cuts out of the most vulnerable people in our country. Well, that was more of a statement than, a, than an actual answer to the question, but I'll move on. Um, one of the things we've heard about is uh, that, um, anecdotally, that the private lenders are not keen on letting to tenants on benefits. and. Uh, I think certainly throughout my life we've all seen the no DSS signs that people put up. So um, one of the questions that has come up is, you know, can the Scottish Government do anything to prevent landlords advertising accommodation as no DSS? What, what can we do to actually encourage landlords to, to engage with people who are um, claiming benefits? Um, one of the things which I would say from the outset, convener, is that uh, uh, use of the term no DSS in adverts uh, in private re rented sector properties is something um, that we disapprove of strongly. Um, we very much sympathise um, with people who are struggling to find affordable rented property uh, who are in receipt of state benefits. Um, individuals and families uh, who have had to rely on what remains of the safety net. Now, while equality legislation, as Ms Ballantyne is very awa well aware, is still uh, a reserved matter, um, it is uh, within the powers of the Scottish Parliament and uh, Scottish Ministers to encourage equal opportunities uh, and the observance of equal opportunity requirements. Um, and we can confirm uh, that uh, preventing use of the blanket term no DSS uh, was discussed with the industry in developing the new regulatory regime uh, for letting agents here in Scotland. Uh, that new regime 
uh, includes a statutory code of practice and compulsory training requirements. Um, the code set out the standard expected um, of letting agents operating in Scotland uh, and how they manage their businesses uh, and provide the services that they do to people. Uh, the code includes an overarching standard uh, which requires that all, all letting agents uh, must not unlawfully discriminate against a landlord, a tenant or applicant. In addition, uh, letting agents must have undertaken uh, training on equality issues before they can be entered into the Scottish Register of Letting Agents. Um, it's hoped that these measures um, will strengthen regulation of the letting agent, letting agent industry here in Scotland and will raise standards where, there is, uh, where this is needed uh, to help uh, to build a more effective sector uh, that meets the needs of all. Um, I would say again, convener, though, um, in terms of the general thrust of this. While we can put in place all of this regulation in terms of dealing um, with letting agents and others, uh, the key thing in all of this um, would be to see equality, a reserved matter, devolved to this parliament uh, so we could take even further action when it comes to that kind of discrimination uh, and other discriminations which we see. Can I just check then? So, so this, the legislation you're talking about, you refer to letting agents. So that won't cover private landlords, you know, people who, who rent out their own home, you know, their, their properties and they manage them themselves. Is that correct? For all of those folks who let out using letting agents, which is a, a huge amount of the sector, mm -hmm. um, in terms of private landlords, individual private landlords, what I can do and will do on uh, 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 in, in every occasion um, is discussed with the Scottish Association of Landlords and others uh, around about their obligations and all of this. But I come back to the crunch in all of this, and it's uh, the uh, scenario that Ms Ballantyne seems to be trying to avoid uh, all day today is that the vast bulk of that power, the equality powers, rest with the UK government. The UK government uh, should act in this in terms of equality legislation. Um, however, what I would like to see are those powers devolved to this parliament so that we can take even greater action uh, to rid our country of that kind of discrimination. Well, on equalities, I'm Mrs. Ballantyne, not Miss. And uh, actually, I was asking a couple of questions. I wasn't avoiding anything. Thank you. Uh, no, Michelle, do. can I just mop up a couple of things around that? I don't want to um, misrepresent the Scottish Association of Landlords, but I think, and that's always a dangerous thing, that they had said that they thought the sector would be more likely rather than less likely to let to UC uh, tenants if uh, the rent component <coughs> of universal credit went direct to landlords. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's an accurate representation of where they, there, wh where they were. And we've had that discussion already about Scottish choices and everything else. I'm just wondering if the Scottish Government has given particular thought about um, how Scottish choices applies and that default and opt-in and opt-out, particularly in relation to the private sector, given concerns we're hearing about them being less likely to rent to UC uh, uh, claimants at the moment. Um, I certainly wouldn't be wanting to put uh, words in the mouth of the Scottish Association of Landlords, uh, landlords either, convener. Um, what I would say is that certainly um, this is an area uh, which uh, I'm willing to discuss with um, John Blackwood and others within SAL um, to see if they're finding um, these, uh, these difficulties. Um, you know, in recent meetings uh, with uh, Scottish Association of Landlords, uh, we've covered uh, other topics and not necessarily this one. Uh, but that's certainly something that I'm willing to explore with them to see what the situation okay, I'll, I'll is I'll and what um, uh, evidence that they are getting back from their membership. And I'll certainly have to just double check that I, I captured that, that, that accurately. Are there any other ways of using the social security system, be that the UK government at a reserve level or the Scottish government? And I, I, I accept uh, a much more narrower scope of 
of, of powers that we could use the system to encourage the private rented sector, be that around uh, rent deposits. Um, and I know there's rent deposit schemes run, run, run throughout the country, but they tend to be relatively low-level low deposits, and sometimes private landlords are looking for two, three, four, five months deposits, and that can be a barrier for a lot of people accessing the private rented sector. Is there a way we could use the social security system a bit more innovatively to, to, to support people into it? Um, convener, as you pointed out, there are a number of schemes which are run by local authorities across the country um, in terms of deposit guarantee schemes. Um, uh, they uh, work well in many places. Again, um, you know, it's something that uh, we uh, talk about in terms of sharing uh, best practice. Uh, I don't think that this is necessarily uh, a matter for the social security system um, per se, um, but it is something um, you know, that we can discuss further um, with local authorities. Uh, I'm sure that um, uh, you uh, and others around the table are well aware of where these schemes are working well in various parts of the country. I know that they do not exist everywhere, um, but it is something um, that we should encourage. Okay, thank you. Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, the, the Scottish Government's written submission shows that 2,800 households in Scotland, um, the majority of them families with children, are subject to the benefit cap. And that was an issue that was raised with us when we visited um, organisations and individuals in Leith a few weeks ago. Now, there's part of DHP funding that is notional, notionally allocated to the benefit cap. And I'm just wondering if you had any figures on how many capped households that covers. Um, convener, I don't... Um think I have that to hand, but I'll maybe uh, talk a little bit through this and I, I may be able to find um, figures. Um, in terms of the benefit cap itself, uh, it has obviously had a major impact on the families uh, that Ms Johnson uh, has spoken about. Um, there has been some very good practice um, in some local authorities uh, at an early stage, authorities working proactively and spotting those families who uh, were likely to be affected by that cap uh, and trying to move them, in some cases, from quite expensive uh, private rented housing um, into the social sector. Um, so I applaud the authorities um, who have moved uh, uh, in that way, and I think that that is something um, that we should be encouraging all authorities um, to do. Um, in terms of um, uh, statistics themselves, um, uh, which uh, uh, are um, broken down in some cases into local authorities, which I think would be better if we sent to um, the committee rather than me reading it out. Mm -hmm. um, in Scotland, what we have um, as a whole among families to whom the cap is applied through housing benefit as opposed to UC, 89% contain children, 77% have three or more, while 64% are lone parent households. Uh, both lone parent families and those with three or more children are uh, priority groups, uh, as Ms Johnson will be aware, um, outlined in our Tackling Child Fuel, uh, Poverty Delivery Plan. Um, nearly 93% of all um, who are affected by the benefit cap contain uh, children, um, and many of those uh, uh, families have a significant, uh, si significant proportion uh, of larger families. Um, the, the majority of households affected um, are um, uh, within the social sector, but one third in the private sector. We have collated some of the available DWP data on the benefit cap in Scotland uh, through using a number of measures. All of this, as I say, is broken down into local authority um, level. And rather than me reading all of this out, I think it would be best if I did send this to Ms Johnson, because um, it is a little bit complex in terms of the table yeah. itself. No, that, that would be very helpful. I mean, certainly two of the, the young parents I met had you know, they were spoken, speaking of being served with a notice to quit simply as a, 
and the impact of the cap and you know potentially finding themselves in temporary accommodation which you know it doesn't save anyone any money um uh, you know there are long term costs and damage there but I, I can, I, can I maybe respond to that? Because I, I, this goes back to the original point. What we would like to see is local authorities acting proactively in these kind of situations and helping fa families uh, move um, from the likes of very expensive private rented accommodation to housing in the social sector. That has helped greatly. Um, convener, I don't want to talk about individual local authorities necessarily at this moment in terms of what, they've, um, what they have done. But that best practice, I can assure Ms Johnson, we have been trying to get other local authorities to follow. It is best for them, it is best for the families, uh, because acting in that pre proactive manner stops us having to deal with crisis and stopped, stops us having to deal um, with the likes of having families in temporary accommodation. No, I'm, I, mean, I know the, the Minister will be aware of the, the situation is particularly acute in different parts of, of the, the country. Um, I think that's, you know, that was a meeting that took place in Edinburgh and it's that you know the pressures are, are well understood, um, and, and there were concerns raised that sometimes that social housing could take young parents away from family and friends. So it is, uh, you know, I appreciate the, the the minister's comments and that there is a <coughs> there's work on ongoing to make sure that this doesn't have any worse an impact than it has to. Is there any work being, you know, are local authorities in the Scottish government able to, you know, reach out to families impacted by the cap to? To help them apply for, you know, reserve benefits that might confer a cap exemption. Um, again, um, convener, knowing some of the work that's going on in certain places, uh, one of the key things in all of this is income maximisation um, for um, these families, um, and there is good work going on in that regard um, in many parts of Scotland. Um, we uh, uh, obviously. Uh, want to ensure as we move forward in all of this, whether it be social security or whether um, it be housing or any other uh, area of government, we want to make sure um, that base practice is exported um, uh, uh, and so that people are doing their level best for uh, those folks who are um, the most vulnerable. Um, I think, again, convener, uh, if it's useful to the committee, um, we can provide examples of some of the work um, that has gone on in certain places uh, around about all of that. And it's not just local authorities um, that, of course, are involved in income maximisation. As I said earlier on, housing associations as key anchor organisations often have some of the ver very best money advice services uh, out there uh, and they do uh, the best that they possibly can uh, to help those folks who um, have been affected by the benefit cap um, and other c cuts to social security. Um, if I can go back to Ms Johnson's uh, first point and then I'll hand over to the Cabinet Secretary because obviously the government wants folk um, to spend as little time as in temporary accommodation as possible. Um, and it is uh, somewhat daft that folk are being moved from, uh, uh, from housing, settled housing, because of these cuts um, uh, into temporary accommodation. And I think, again, that is something that the UK government ne needs to take cognizance of uh, in terms of the formulation uh, of what, to me, is a particularly daft policy. Um, but obviously in terms of trying to uh, uh, lessen and uh, eventually eradicate the, uh, the uh, use of temporary accommodation, that means delivering more homes. Uh, and of course, as the committee is aware, um, in this uh, parliament, uh, our pledge is to deliver 50,000 affordable homes, 35,000 for social rent, the biggest uh, housing programme for decades. Uh, that will go a long way to helping with, uh, with some of this. Just add uh, two quick points, um, convener. I think it's very important when we discuss the benefit cap to recognise um, that the benefit cap still applies uh, to those who, within the system, are not expected to work. So if the UK government were to, uh, even if they were insisting in keeping a benefit cap, if they were at least to take out of uh, the benefit cap those uh, who are not expected to work, that would certainly alleviate some of the hardship, particularly for, as Mr Stewart's been saying, some of the most vulnerable within our community. So there is a, 
there is a, a difficulty within the system that we are in effect capping people's benefits but they cannot go out and work are indeed not even expected to go out and work by the DWP themselves that would you know if, if changes like that were made again the Scottish Government wouldn't be having to try and mitigate against a fault within the reserved system which would obviously free up uh, funding within the Scottish Block Grant to, for example, be able to fund uh, other areas within DHPs or anywhere else in social security. Uh, it's also very important to, to recognise if we're trying to assist through DHPs, uh, it's only effective for those that are entitled to actually apply for it. So the, again, the challenge is that we can attempt to mitigate against areas around the benefit cap and are indeed doing so and local authorities are taking that forward but it only works if we can get the message out there that people should apply so inherently once again the best way to deal with these problems is to deal with them at source and actually stop the benefit cap and don't not put people into the position where they are under hardship, which again, Scottish Government and local authorities are attempting to sort a workaround to be able to assist some of the most vulnerable in our society. Can I ask you, um, when we heard from Sheila Haig from the City of Edinburgh Council, um, she told us that it is difficult to get people to apply um, for a DHP, even when they know what's available. So, you know, obviously... You know, I, I wish this wasn't required, but what can we do to, to try and help people who may be entitled to, to make that application? Well, I think that kind of ties into some of the, the areas that we're doing around the whole of Social Security is around income maximisation, ensuring that people know if there is support out there, then they should uh, apply for it. It gets to the discussions we've been having in other committees, uh, deliberations around the stigma of applying, whether um, people feel that they you know, can apply for these aspects. So just because someone is entitled to it, there's a whole myriad of different work that can go on at a local authority level and a Scottish government level to be able to encourage that take up of that and to ensure that people uh, apply for it. So I, I think you're quite right to point to the challenge of having the scheme is not enough. It's ensuring that those who, who are, and again, the evidence that the committee has had uh, will be exceptionally interesting as we move forward with our deliberations around DHP and take up in general about how do we do this in a way where people are aware of it encouraged to apply and supported to apply and if we get that right then we can make a difference to those people but I again go back to the point that that only works uh, for a percentage it doesn't take away the problem at source which is what we really need to see to stop people jumping through hoops to try and get the, some uh, entitlements to get them out of a very difficult position okay thank you thank you okay um, Keith Brown will you want to come in there it, just to come back, if I can, it, it's a theme that's run through a number of the questions and answers. Um, going back, first of all, to I think Mark Griffin's point, and apologies if I'm getting this wrong, I, I think the issue with Scottish Choices is we heard evidence, which I recall the DWP saying there was no difference. It was essentially the same you know, work for them to apply Scottish Choices or alternative payment arrangements. And I, I understand what the Cabinet Secretary is saying is that... Um, the amount of money we are paying for this is worth it for us to get the outcomes that we're getting. But I suppose the issue is whether the DWP is justified in asking for that money um, when they're also telling us there's no difference as to how they administer the system. And I, I know the Cabinet Secretary is committed to looking again at the evidence. I, I would like to see some um, response to that, whether it's just the DWP plucking figures out there and saying we're going to charge you this to do this. But on the more substantive point, given all the problems there are with the system, and I think the Cabinet Secretary referred to almost like a queue of different IT changes that are waiting to be um, uh, implemented, uh, and given the fact that universal credit, I think it was first mentioned at least seven years ago, I think, by Ian Duncan Smith, um, and given how long the Westminster government has known that this parliament was going to have social security powers, is there not a major failure here to implement a system which is sufficiently flexible to do what we're often hearing thrown about, we'll just mitigate it or change it. It's easy to do, but well, it patently isn't. It's extremely expensive. The system seems really inflexible, and every little change to it seems to come at some huge cost. Surely there's a failure 
in the planning of the universal credit system. We, we heard, for example, in a previous evidence session that some of the legacy systems at the DWP go back to 1948 and comprise a paper-based system in a warehouse. Um, so it, it, what worries me is that the IT procurement in relation to universal credit has been a complete failure to anticipate the flexibilities that are required. Well, I think on, on the point around uh, the difference between what's uh, proposed within alternative payments and within Scottish choices, uh, there is a difference in the offer. In essence, from the DWP's perspective, I could presume, and I certainly not like to speak for the DWP in any way, shape or form, but I'm presuming what they meant that the, impl the implementation from their aspect um, is, is the same. So it's a difference in the, the policy um, and in the offer, but in effect, from an operational perspective, you're either doing one or you're doing the other. So I, I think that's what they're, they're, they're getting at uh, within that aspect of it. I think the challenge when you're looking at any changes to universal credit really does go back to the initial way that universal credit was set up and the difficulties that have been for the DWP over a myriad of years to implement universal credit because it was done in such a way where uh, you know, policy set very separate from operations and the policy and, and the operations when they came together to actually present a system, it just doesn't work. That leaves them in a very difficult position of constantly trying to fix the problems. Now, some of the problems that they will freely admit to, to, to doing are because that they've accepted there's an issue. There are some that are just inherently inbuilt into the system and at a political level they believe should be there. For example, the, the five-week wait. So there are areas where there will be no change because at a political level they don't want there to be. Are the areas where the DWP do accept there's a change, because there's just frankly so many of them, then it's very, very difficult, particularly for the larger IT, and that makes it inherently inflexible. That's exactly why, when we're looking at what we're doing within Social Security Scotland, we have um, adopted an agile method to the project delivery to ensure that policy is working hand in hand with operations within the programme, that we're building that on an incremental basis, so we're constantly learning and adapting before go live, and then indeed obviously after go live, to ensure we don't reach the same problems of, of inflexibility. So I think Mr Brown's quite right to point out to the challenges of getting the DWP to do anything on UC uh, in the areas where we're interested around the devolution of benefits, because I say quite frankly, it is a very, very small part of a much, much wider programme of work that they have just on universal credit, never mind everything else that's going on within the, the DWP. And that makes it inherently difficult for the Scottish Government to see, uh, to, to see any traction uh, with that, because we are absolutely um, not in charge of the timetable of when that happens. That is utterly down to the DWP about where we are and whether that timetable or slips. We've seen that within the bedroom tax, um, and the concern, obviously, is then how quickly we will be able to deliver split payments, for example, another area which the committee has taken a keen interest in, because, again, the IT solution has to be done by the DWP. There simply is no other way to do it. Okay. Um, we've heard quite a bit this morning in relation to like, the Minister McKean understand to talk about uh, impacts on those using temporary accommodation and families in relation to welfare reform. Um, has the Scottish Government made any assessment of the impacts of welfare reform on homelessness in Scotland? Is there an evidence base, not anecdotally, but is there an evidence base in terms of here are the welfare reforms, here's the analysis, this is how it's impacting homelessness or the use of temporary accommodation. Is there something you could provide the committee with in relation to that? Uh, convener, I'm sure that we could provide you with uh, a lot of data, and as you're well aware, um, there's a huge amount of data and evidence being gathered by uh, neutral parties, by uh, third sector organisations and others on the impact of all of these social security cuts, all these welfare reforms, 
uh, on uh, homelessness here in Scotland. Um, uh, I think you know I could refer you to uh, the recent crisis report, um, which quite clearly pointed the finger um, at the uh, rise in homelessness um, on uh, the uh, benefit cap, uh, the changes to universal credit, uh, and the catalogue of other disastrous changes um, that there have been. We will provide you um, with data and all of that, convener. Obviously, um, as we move forward, uh, we have got uh, an ambitious plan here in Scotland um, to um, uh, eradicate rough sleeping, to improve temporary accommodation, and to hopefully end homelessness for good. Uh, and we're making great strides in terms of the investment uh, that we are making and the changes that we are making, which are making a real difference um, to uh, people's lives here. But we're doing all of that uh, against the backdrop uh, of, of uh, all of these welfare cuts. Um, Convener, I, I won't go into too much depth, but uh, in 2018, the government itself uh, published uh, a report on the impact of welfare reform on tenants in both the private and social rented sector. Um, that is, was the third follow-up paper uh, to the annual report on welfare reform, and it covers uh, all uh, of the impacts of welfare cuts in the housing sector. I'm more than happy uh, to share all of that with the committee. I, mean, I think that, that would be helpful. Um, I do want to ask a little bit more about Trying to be a bit more positive about if you know if reforms to social security system can have a detrimental impact on homelessness. By definition, it, other reforms of how we use monies within the system could have a positive impact on tackling homelessness. And I, I, I certainly know from my own experience in Glasgow uh, before uh, the the winter night shelter closed in Glasgow, the opportunity to go along and see the work in action there. So I saw you know. It's Glasgow City Council social workers embedded with, 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 with the team there. I, I was aware of other people after that saying to me, well, there, there, there's, there's others who are rough sleeping who, for whatever reason, won't use that shelter. I know from my caseload that there are people who won't use, who are homeless, who are sofa surfing, who won't use temporary accommodation, uh, particularly the working poor, because of the cost of it and the cost of even storing furniture to move into a furnished flat. Uh, it, 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 it's punitive for what can be pretty poor quality accommodation. And we're left with a picture that actually, despite a, lot, a heck of a lot of good work uh, and financial pressures, there is a lot of money in the system when you look at housing benefit and you look at the cost of the temporary accommodation. And I do know that uh, the Homeless and Rough Sleeping Action Group had something meaningful to say around all of that, wanting to get a stronger evidence base and, and there's moves afoot with the, Scot part of the Scottish Government about how we could best use all those monies in relation to temporary accommodation, potentially devolved here to Scotland fully, and actually use that in a way that gets better outcomes for everyone. Um, so we're looking for positives as well as negatives. How could we, how could we reform the social security system to assist? Can, can to we there, there, there are uh, a lot of positives um, out there. Um, you know, you talked about the... Uh, Glasgow Night Shelter, um, and we've yet to get all of the uh, analysis of the winter interventions. Uh, but, but because of some of the changes that have taken place in certain places, with the likes of embedding uh, of the right staff uh, in these places, we are moving folk on quicker um, off the streets. Um, and into accommodation. Uh, and I think, um, without going into too much depth here, uh, I understand that from the Glasgow night shelter alone, on one occasion, somebody presented themselves in the, at the night shelter um, and was actually in accommodation uh, the next day. Uh, the accommodation that they wanted, uh, that they felt safe and secure. And now that um, is a, a major uh, move forward in terms of ensuring that we join up services uh, to do our very, very best um, uh, for people. And, you know, the entire um, ethos uh, of the rapid rehousing and transition plans that we've asked all local authorities to prepare is to ensure that we have that joined up approach uh, and we do what is right um, for folks. Now, uh, my uh, uh, homelessness team 
uh, are working very hard uh, uh, in terms of uh, looking at all of the information that has come back in rapid rehousing transition plans. Uh, again, uh, we are ensuring that best practice uh, is going to be exported in all of this so that everybody is starting um, from a good base. Uh, and all of that uh, will require the bending of spend uh, and using it uh, to deal uh, with helping people at the early stages rather um, than dealing uh, with uh, all uh, of this at crisis point for individuals uh, and for families. Now, you mentioned, um, convener, um, the devolution um, of housing benefit, uh, per, uh, the Harsha group in particular uh, uh, talked uh, and recommended um, uh, a devolution around about uh, housing benefit for temporary accommodation, which would allow us even greater flexibility um, to transform um, those services. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, you heard um, from uh, DWP officials last week um, that the UK government was unwilling uh, to devolve uh, these areas of business. And it's quite unfortunate um, the, uh, the way that this has been done because, um, you know, myself and uh, the COSLA spokesperson, Councillor Eleanor Whittam, uh, wrote to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions some time ago asking um, uh, to, uh, for the devolution of this. We have yet to receive a response, even though my officials um, uh, have been on and on at the DWP, and yet it seems um, that Ms Rudd is quite happy for her officials to come here um, and say that there will be no devolution when we have not had uh, a formal response as a government. I can appreciate how unsatisfactory that is. I suppose what I want to make sure what this committee does is we stay focused that we're a social security committee, we're not the local government committee when we look at these aspects. So we would have, a, I suspect, a strong interest in seeing how the monies could be best used, so how those social security monies could be best used. So despite the fact you have had the answers that you don't want, although not directly from the UK government, but via civil servants, um, will modelling work continue in relation to how you would best use those monies? Because you can get to a stage where you say, well, you're not devolving the, the cash that's in the system that we could use more flexibly, but you can quantify the cash in the system that's currently been spent that could be devolved, and then you could model how that money could be better used. And it then makes a powerful case to say, this is how this money should be spent, now please devolve it or get on and do the job in partnership with us. So is that work ongoing irrespective of the, the, the current refusal? Sure, um, Convener, it is absolutely vital um, that we work together with partners to do our level best to make the changes that are required within the system. Um, and I have to say that the cooperation um, from local authorities and from third sector partners as we have moved forward in implementing the HARSAG recommendations have been absolutely top notch. Um, you know, the level of cooperation, information sharing, uh, and, uh, you know, it's the spreading of best practice is top notch. Um, what we are missing in all of this is a key partner who controls a huge amount of the purse strings, who if they came into play, you know, and worked with us, um, we would be able to do so much more in terms of transforming uh, these services. Unfortunately, from what uh, we've heard uh, from uh, evidence given to your committee last week, it seems that the UK government is unwilling uh, to devolve uh, this area. Um, uh, I, say I await the official response uh, from the Secretary of State. But if they're unwill unwilling to devolve, they should at the very least enter into dialogue with us around about how um, certain changes could be brought into play to make a huge difference uh, for the lives of so many of the most vulnerable folk in Scotland. I think it would be helpful for, for our committee to be kept updated if there is any movement or progress, not in the devolution, it doesn't look as if that's going anywhere, but in terms of 
that that dialogue is, is that it, it have has it been quantified just how much money there is in the system uh, in relation to housing benefit that is being used to support sometimes unsatisfactory networks of temporary accommodation and not doing a lot of the early intervention stuff that clearly local authorities and government wants to do so how much money swirling about the system um, that is a number that I kind of give you off of the top of my head, um, convener, uh, and it would be uh, uh, unwise of me uh, to, to, to take a, a stab in the dark um, in that regard. What we do know um, is, you know, the local authorities them themselves um, are spending significant sums uh, on homelessness uh, and the support um, of uh, vulnerable people. Uh, we ourselves as a government, uh, as folks are well aware, um, have put more money into the system. Um, in terms of the housing benefit number, I, I don't have that um, at this moment. But, you know, let's be honest, that is the biggest number. That is the biggest number. And in order to, 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 to do a complete transformation, it would be easier to do all of that if that money, that resource um, was in play. But beyond that, to have a partner who is willing to discuss with us how changes that they could make, even if they're not going to devolve it, how changes they could make, make it easier for us to change the system for the better of the people here. It's not only an issue um, for us here in Scotland, it's also an issue, for example, um, for the metro mayors um, in England, all of this. Um, you know, um, and I w met with um, uh, the Metro Mayor of Liverpool, Steve Rotherham, um, and the Metro Mayor of uh, Manchester, Andy Burnham, during the course of last summer. Um, obviously, they have got um, ambitious uh, uh, policies uh, coming into play in terms of transforming homelessness in their areas as well. They will face the same difficulties as, as us in this regard, unless there is a change in thought from the DWP around about housing benefit. I hope uh, that they will see sense, and if they choose not to devolve it, which I hope they do devolve it, if they choose not to, then I hope they will have a rethink of the system. OK, um, just before I kind of finish this line of questioning, um, I alluded to the very high cost of temporary accommodation, you know, some deeply poor quality temporary accommodation costing up to £1,000 a month. You could get a, a detached property in parts of my constituency uh, and pay the mortgage uh, and, and stay, in, stay in a lovely property and it would cost you less than some of the costs of the poor quality temporary accommodation. Uh, I know Harsag were looking at that and they made some recommendations around that. Um, do we know why the costs of temporary accommodation is so high in Scotland and is it is it something about the way the social security system is currently structured that makes it so high? Um, first of all, um, convener, I should say um, that the vast bulk of people who are in temporary accommodation here in Scotland are in mainstream uh, social housing. Uh, and obviously our ambition is to make sure that as many folks as possible who are in temporary accommodation uh, to be uh, in that kind of setting uh, rather than anything else. Um, and that is why um, you know, we have moved uh, in terms of expanding, um, uh, well, uh, in terms of uh, reducing, uh, not expanding, reducing the length of time that uh, uh, families and pregnant women can spend in unsuitable accommodation. And that's why we're making the moves uh, to include everyone in that in order um, to, to make all of uh, this right. Obviously, as we move forward um, in terms of the funding and the costs of temporary accommodation, uh, we need to build a new framework. Um, and it would be so much better if the DWP were involved uh, in all of that. We are currently um, doing a huge amount of work um, in conducting a robust analysis of the existing funding models um, that are out there. Um, that's based on data uh, that has been supplied by local authorities and others. Um, and working in partnership with them, uh, we uh, will design a revised funding model uh, and determine uh, you know, 
how we go forward uh, in that regard. Um, convener, um, we can set out uh, in more depth um, our responses to um, HARSAG and how we're moving forward uh, on all of these fronts. Uh, I'm sure that the, this committee is interested only um, in the um, aspects that uh, revolve around housing benefit and social security as a whole. Um, but we are moving forward apace uh, in every sense uh, of the word uh, in ensuring that we get to the point of uh, dealing uh, with uh, the recommendations and responding positively to the recommendations that were put forward by, by HARSAG. I will caveat that, convener, because obviously, while the government itself accepted every single one of those recommendations, all 70 put forward by the group, we did have to caveat six of them. Uh, and those are the ones uh, where we don't have the powers over the benefits that there are. The, the, all of that is very helpful, and I don't want to do the mission drift into, into aspects of, of housing and homelessness, but what would be helpful, um, if, even if you could drop the committee a note after this session, where we are keen to capture how much housing benefit in the system doesn't look as if it's been used efficiently. We are keen to capture, um, just l let me just finish the, this point, uh, uh, Mr Stewart, we are keen to capture just how much money there is in the system supporting temporary accommodation, which does appear to be, whether it's, the cost is inflated, but it does appear to be substantial costs, because if we move towards a recommendation that says um, we think there's a significant amount of money in the system that so the social security system could much better use to get better outcomes for those who have to go through the homelessness system, including living in temporary accommodation. We kind of need to know how much money there is in the system and, and how many people might benefit from that. Without us remotely being aware of what that, those changes would look like, we do have to quantify some of this. So it would be very helpful, I think, to the committee. We'll endeavour to provide you with the information around about what we know about housing benefit spend in, in Scotland. Um, I, I, you saw me uh, look there, convener. Um, it was the use uh, of the word um, efficiently, because in some regards, you know, there are going to be higher housing benefit costs for some individuals in specialised accommodation than there are in others. Now, I get your point that you um, are getting across that um, you find it difficult and probably the committee finds it difficult to believe the cost of some of that accommodation. We'll try and capture some of that information for you uh, and we'll send it to the committee. I, I, think, I think that would be very helpful. Um, I have no further questions. Any of our colleagues have any further questions this morning? Uh, can I thank you uh, to, to everyone, uh, Cabinet Secretary, Minister and your officials for coming along and supporting our evidence session this morning. Um, if there are any uh, additional information you want to give us, we are about to report shortly on this. If you could give it to us um, at your earliest opportunity, just to allow us to get on with uh, uh, looking at a, a report on this. So th thank you everyone for coming along this morning. We'll suspend briefly before we move to the next agenda item.
Okay, um, we now move to agenda item three, which is correspondence from the Finance and uh, Constitution uh, Committee. Uh, and can refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk and letter from Finance and Constitution Committee and papers four and five, which are spice briefings relating to the matter. The Finance and Constitution Committee wrote to, sub to all subject committees on the 25th of March 2019 with a view to exploring a more coordinated approach with other Scottish parliamentary committees to develop the Scottish Parliament's scrutiny role in relation to the new powers arising from the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. It has asked for any views on three areas, legislation, common frameworks and international treaties. Paragraph 8 of the note by the clerk suggests what the committee may wish to say in its response. Um, I might put that on the record shortly, but just before I, I, I do that, is there any comments that, that, that members may wish, wish to make? Keith Brown. I was just going to say, uh, convener, that um, I think it's a really important, perhaps an obvious point, that um, it shouldn't be just for the agreements reached between the UK government and the Scottish government to rest with Scottish ministers. I think it's quite important the Parliament has a role, which I think has been substantially truncated and um, trodden upon during the progress of Brexit. But I think on an ongoing basis, especially when these powers if you like, have been agreed between the two governments. Parliament's got a duty to have the maximum possible uh, amount of scrutiny, and I think anything which allows us to do that flexibly. It's probably less relevant for this committee than many others, I would imagine, but um, I'm very supportive of the idea that we have the maximum possible uh, scrutiny. I, I, on the Seoul Convention, I'm a wee bit cynical about that, given that the UK government's stated position in court was that this was merely a self-denying ordinance, and I think that level of contempt is often shown by the UK government, but... Um, I am generally very supportive of it. Okay, any other comments before? Uh, so, what has been uh, suggested, and I would be content with this, uh, uh, in Parry, it says, in such circumstances, responding to the Finance and Constitution Committee, the committee may wish to support the recommendations of the DPLR Committee in its report on the Immigration uh, and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill, and that as a matter of principle, I suppose this is the key bit. The Scottish Parliament should have an opportunity to scrutinise the exercise of any legislative power relating to devolved social security powers. Further, that where the power in relation to devolved social security is to be exercised by a UK minister alone, it should only be with the consent of Scottish ministers. And finally, that a process is put in place whereby the Scottish Parliament is able to scrutinise any proposal by Scottish ministers to give their consent to the exercise of the powers by a UK minister in advance of that consent been given. I know that clarity in relation to what that means. For me, that effectively means this parliament should, in advance, do robust scrutiny at all times. Um, and I would be content with, with that position. Um, so I would ask members whether they're content to, to reply uh, to Bruce Crawford, the convener, uh, along those lines. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. That being the case, we now move to agenda item four, uh, which is to continue our consideration of evidence of social security support for housing, which will be conducted in private. So we now move into private session. <laughs>